Welcome to Behind the Dock Lens. I'm your host, Olga Medvedev-Young. Our guest today is Taya Arboleta, an Emmy Award and Telly Award-winning filmmaker who's also a professor, a keynote speaker, and performance lecturer. As a television producer, director, writer, and entertainer, Taya has spent 23 years creating commercial and educational programs for television and distribution. He's here today to give us insight to that passion through his film, Crossing the Line, Multiracial Comedians. This PBS documentary investigates the power of language and its effects on American identity. This is Behind the Dark Lens. Multiracial Americans have always been forced to choose sides. I think it's one of those things when you start out as a kid, you don't really know what race is. If racial classifications are vague, then where's the line? Who you think you are, you think you're cute, you think you got good hair, you think you got light eyes and all that. And who is allowed to cross it? My mother, her dad was a Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, and my father was a member of the Black Panther Party. It's weird because since I'm white and black, I never know which part of me is gonna come out when and where. What's up, my niggers? What's oh shit? How can one simple word blossom into an incendiary device? Oh, what did you just say? You know, comedian or not, you know, you can go too far. If you're a comic and you can't handle a heckler and you have to start calling them names, then you just shouldn't be in stand-up. That's what makes stand-up dangerous. From San Francisco, Berkeley, Los Angeles to New York City. Producers Taya Arboleta and Darby Lipo Price explore this question to expose the very nature of where pain and laughter come from in a racially divided world. I was very aware of being mixed, of course, and my mom is Pennsylvania Dutch, my dad is Chinese American, and I always tried to overemphasize the Pennsylvania Dutch part. I mean, I know I, I, I look and sound like an anime experiment gone horribly wrong. <laughs> If I was gonna fly my freak flag, it's the mixed race freak flag, okay? And nobody wants to be called Filipino except for Mexicans trying to get their driver's licenses, you know? Comedians are charged with offering insight and validating that which makes us laugh. <laughs> Nigger, dead hunk. But in a divided world, at whose expense? You know, we all hear humor. You know, and life is funny, period. She better be funny like Richie Pryor, otherwise I want my money back. What's the big deal if I'm black and a Jew? I'll make Shabbat for you. From a historical context, racial domination system that has developed over the last three or four hundred years was built on the fiction of racial purity. To current abuses. But, you know, you can imagine in China, it's like, Ching Chong, Chong, Ching Chong, Ching Chong, Danny DeVito, Ching Chong, Chong, Chong. From grassroots efforts to restrict language. This is what it's about. We need to stop this N-word thing. This is what it's about. To an overwhelming mission to test the First Amendment. Black people is niggas. From the perspectives of multiracial comedians. This is the image of the future. In the future, you're gonna look like me. I am super Jesus. I love you, Dad. And experts on race, such as Harvard University law professor and author of the book Nigger, Randall Kennedy. Depending on the context. If the context is, is comedy, for me, that opens things up a great deal. And Helena Herschel, multicultural psychotherapist. If they talk about themselves in a way that's oppressing themselves, I think that's kind of crossing the line. This documentary gives a balanced view to facilitate powerful discussion on a serious and timely subject. I find people having conversations like, we were at the movies and these black people were just, wait, Eric, are you black? <laughs> I get black people too, though. They're always like, man, you told him crackers. I'm like, pardon me? <laughs> you jigaboos need to move along. I don't know what's here. Please welcome our guest, Taya Arboleta. Taya, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's such a pleasure. So tell me, what inspired you to come up with a documentary about multiracial comedians? As a former multiracial comedian myself, I had found that uh, through the years I was doing that kind of work, I had to explain myself, right? Because most comedians have to sort of uh, prompt the audience with why they're going to make jokes about certain things. Multiracial comedians particularly have to explain why they can make, let's say, a black or white joke if they're black and white. So 
over the many years traveling around the country, I had to explain myself before uh, making jokes about my own identity because people can't tell immediately what a multiracial person is. But the bigger story really is, and the title of the documentary, Crossing the Line, has two meanings. It's, it's that comedians have to cross the line in order to be funny, but also crossing the line meaning the line, that the, the, the racial divide. So at the time, Michael Richards of Seinfeld had made some nasty remarks, mm. and we started working on this documentary to kind of ask the question, when is it okay to make fun of people based on what they look like or their race? How does a multiracial comedian decide which side to identify with, or do they identify with all sides? There's two answers. Uh, one answer is that it's not necessarily about being a comedian and being multiracial. It's about just being multiracial. Because the question would be then, as a person, as a human being, when do you make the choice to call yourself one thing or another? But I think also it's that the audience has their own language about what race is and how to identify a person on stage. So, you know, if you're very dark, then you're obviously in American culture, you're black. But what if you're not as black? What, what, you know, what if you're not as dark as Obama? Like, my dad is black and my mom is white. I just came out much lighter. But if he was a comedian and we're both on stage together, who would actually have the right to make black jokes? Do I have the right to make black jokes? Do I have the right to make white jokes? Um, and so I think usually I try to start with the question as to how do we all identify ourselves in, in this culture? Do you think that multiracial comedians almost have an advantage to being multiracial? There's an advantage and a disadvantage, of course. Uh, the advantage is if the audience understands where you're coming from, then they're sort of okay with you making the jokes if you actually look or can express the part. If you don't look the part, then it can be a deficit. For example, a good friend of mine who's actually interviewed in the documentary is the daughter of Richard Pryor, Rain Pryor. She and I discuss this often, and she's a comedian as well. Her mom being white Jewish and her father being Richard Pryor, being black. If they don't know who she is, how does she explain it's okay for me to make these jokes, or even Jewish jokes for that matter? I think that ultimately this country is okay when you cross the line if you look the part. Yeah. It's not okay if you don't. And, but th therein lies the whole problem with having to explain it every mm. single time. And multiracial people have to explain it all the time anyway. It's very interesting because different cities experience uh, you know, multiracial comedy differently. Sure. Can you just explain that a little sure. bit? Sure. Well, we did interviews in uh, San Francisco and uh, Berkeley, California, which is similar in many ways, LA and New York City, because I, we wanted to sort of compare how these two major areas uh, would treat the idea of being multiracial differently, and also comedy. And we found that, yeah, there's, there's, a, you know, there, there's some differences, but mass media propagates the whole concept of multiraciality as it is. So on one hand, the audience is local, meaning that here in California, here in LA, this is how we do things, or here in New York, everything's okay. Anything you want is Abercrombie and Fitch, and it's, it's Benetton, you know. Mm. But it's not really in the, in the mind of the media. So uh, on, uh, on one hand, we're affected by how the media treats it. On another hand, we're affected by how, we, how it's treated in our local neighborhoods. Essentially, uh, a New Yorker would probably have a different reaction towards um, multiracial comedy than a San Franciscan would. New York City is, just by the nature of the fact that there's so many immigrants yes. in New York, and that New York has always been a hub for, uh, for people from all over the world. So the language in New York, the cultural language in New York is already very mixed. San Francisco as well, I mean, there's a much larger uh, centralized Asian population in certain areas of San Francisco and Berkeley, Cal uh, Berkeley California areas. But the biggest issue for us in that respect was how do the cities, how do these different urban areas affect each other? Each other. Mm. Yeah. I want to just go into kind of like the root of this comedy and where it comes from. One of the comedians, Mike mm -hmm. Moto, said that neither side wants to claim you. 
it must bring up some pain and some hurtful feelings towards who you are as a person and, and which side you identify. There's always been this facade of the idea that a mixed person lives a tragic life, mm. you know, and there's, always, there's been comedy about that since the early 1900s. The tragic mulatto is, the, is, is one of the common phrases. To be funny, you have to find things that meet the audience's expectations. If the audience isn't expecting multiraciality, it's new. You have to explain the whole thing. Tragedy is the stereotypical, the sort of the tragic com uh, comic or the tragic um, clown, you know, that the clown, behind the clown's makeup is really sadness. And I, I don't know if that's the case. I mean, there's, I don't know how many more comedians go to therapy, for example, than, yeah. <laughs> than the average person. You know, in New York City, everyone goes to therapy because the point is that life is difficult enough. Let's make fun of it. But therein lies the question again, how do you explain to an audience that doesn't understand why it's okay? That becomes more tragic for, for a multiracial comedian because if it doesn't work, then you have to explain it again. So if the comedy doesn't work, if Rain Pryor's on stage, or if I'm on stage and we're telling jokes and the audience doesn't get the multiraciality component, they're not gonna understand the comedy. So you have to explain it every single time. So Specificity is important for a comedian. If you, let's say you are a very large comedian, no doubt, most likely, some of your jokes will probably have something to do with, your, with being large. If you are Asian, East Asian, most likely some of your jokes would have to do with that. So um, it's almost of self-deprecating nature then. A lot of comedy lot might of, be, yeah. certainly. I would say that it's a lot healthier to be self-deprecating than it is to be uh, to cross the line against other people. Other people. Yeah. So let's talk about sure. crossing the line. Yep. When is it appropriate to cross the line? Um, never. Actually to cross the line. So uh, cross the line in terms of being inappropriate. Yes. Right. So for example, was it funny that Michael Richards used the N-word frivolously in his ty tirade? No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Yes. Was it funny? No. Was it effective? Yes because it then set the precedent for the, the question to be asked, when is it okay? Because he's not actually technically a comedian. He is a comic actor. So when is it okay? It's not okay to perpetrate against others. Then the personal question is, is it okay to cross the line for yourself? For yourself. And I say, I don't think so. For example, Bill Cosby is a black comedian. Uh, Chris Rock is a black comedian. The question I always pose to audiences is, Chris Rock uses the N-word as if it's, you know, Cheerios, right? Um, I have no idea what that just meant. Why, why I said Cheerios? I'm thinking about Cheerios, maybe I'm hungry. Bill Cosby would not use the N-word. The, so the, the question is, is it a, because you're a comedian and you're black, can you say the N-word to be funny? No, you don't have to, because Bill Cosby uh, was a very successful comedian. When Bill Cosby and Chris Rock and Obama sit at the table in the White House, do they all use the N-word to joke with each other? Probably not. For example, I'm Russian. I could pick on myself as a Russian and my experience, but do I need to be careful and make sure that I don't offend all of Russia? Well, that's a good question. Most of Russia is technically in Asia, yeah. right? So <laughs> most Russians look Central Mongolian, right? The Russian parliament is a very, very mixed group of people with beards and all kinds of clothes, you know, nothing like our Congress. So if you represent Russia, then I would ask, well, where in Russia? Yes. You know, and what culture of Russia? And was it the former Soviet Union? Was it all the other Stans? Or is it Russia? Or so is you it... almost have to be specific. Yes, as, as I said earlier, the specificity is important. You have to explain yourself. Yeah. It's a defined place by politics, and it's color-coded on a map. But that's not really who we are, right? Black is what? What is black? How black do you have to be to make black jokes? Exactly where does black become white? Yeah. You know, and no one ever has that answer. It's In true. fact, I have an app called Race Off. Buy it. $1.99. <laughs> and this app is a, is a game, and you, figure out, you try to figure out exactly at what point who is what. You know, that question is so important in America regarding comedy, because the line is completely invisible. I'm working on a national tour with multiracial comedians, and Rain Pryor is going to be one of them. That's really exciting. Yeah. So 
did it take a long time for uh, you know America to say, okay, now that's funny? Because I mean, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago, would those kinds of joke kind of jokes be acceptable? No, because 10, 20, 30 years ago, um, it was black, white, or Negro, and you know, colored Negro, and then you know, Caucasian or white, um, and then you had a you know the propagation of all the different kinds of racial categories. I think that Obama in office has been a great asset. Unfortunately, in the year 2010 national census, he chose only black as his identity, which I think is a kind of a slap in the face to his grandmother and his mother who raised him. Who raised him, yeah. Um, but, you know, it's a choice. It's a personal choice. You know, how does America see him? How does he see himself? Mm. How does Michelle see him? Although he's a sort of a mascot, the pride of being mixed is I think the next step in America becoming truly multicultural. In terms of how you were promoting the film and how you were trying to find the proper channels to um, you know, showcase your film, how did you go about doing that? Well, prior to social media, uh, marketing one's documentary was a little more complicated. It meant more phone calls and, and emails, certainly. Social media makes it easier, but this was prior to that. It was prior to the whole Facebook ad and Google ads and things like that. So, yeah. I mean, I would certainly suggest any filmmaker should use social media as much as possible. Because specificity, I'll bring that up again, is so important in media today. Like you can't make a generic film and expect it to reach a wide audience because why do broad, the, the word broadcast doesn't exist anymore. Even broadcast television is now narrow cast. Everyone's trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. So. If you really understand your subject matter well, if you're doing a documentary and you understand it intrinsically, it's like part of your being, then you can really help move it forward because you will find an audience that will want to watch that documentary and get something out of it. So it's not just a matter of, let's say, getting it on air and then so suddenly the world is going to flock to it. You know, not unless you're Ken Burns or you're someone who already has that kind of name. This documentary, the specificity was not just comedians and race, but multiracial comedians and race, because I knew that multiraciality was going to become the issue. And Obama was running for president at the, at the time, and I just had a feeling that if he won, this was going to set a precedent around the world for what identity is. Well, Tay, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Good luck with your documentary, and hopefully we'll see more of you with your new pieces. Thank you so much for joining us on Behind the Dark Lens. Till next time, I'm your host, Olga Medvedev-Young.